Well, good morning and welcome to California Community Church. I am Pastor Brad, and our church is right here in Agoura Hills, California. For those of you local, you know that. For those of you far away, uh, people said, I wonder where they're located. And now you know. And if you're ever in our area, we would love you to show up in person. But we're so thankful you're a part of our online community. We are in the final week of this series called Jesus Style. How did Jesus deal with very angry and very difficult people? That's the culture we're living in. This is really good information for us as followers of Christ. Let me start today by asking you a question. Have you noticed that nobody uses the phrase anymore, I'm a little upset? And the reason they don't say that is because in our culture, nobody anymore is just a little upset. We go from zero to 60 in two seconds. We go from calm to raging in the, in the blink of an eye. We're like on full tilt in, in a pinball machine. We don't use half measures. We start with a short fuse in one hand and a lit match in the other. We're just waiting, it seems for a reason to explode. We see this anger all around us. We have people who are angry at the government. We have government officials who are angry at ordinary citizens. We've got employers angry at their employees. We have employees walking out the door in record numbers. We've got parents who are mad at their teenagers. But let's be honest, they've probably always been mad. Let's talk about airline travel. I saw something this week. It's just staggering. I mean, intuitively, just by listening to news, I kind of knew we were trending in this direction. But the number of, like, anger-fueled, raging, uh, abusive situations on airlines, oh, my gosh. In 2020, there was 143 reported incidents, okay? 2020 is just two years ago, a year and a half ago. 143. So far in 2021, over 5,000 reports of violence and abuse and unruly passengers. Anger, bitterness, rage. I mean, it's all around us, and the truth of it is, and some of us have acknowledged this through this series, we even see some of it in us. But the good news is you're here. Because you want to know, like I want to know, like we need to know, Jesus style. How did Jesus do this? So we're going to look at an interesting part of the Christian scriptures. It's called the book of Hebrews. And in chapter 12, one of the cool chapters of the book of Hebrews, we're going to find something very, very interesting. I fully know that talking about this topic today, we're going to talk about bitterness it's going to raise some issues for some of you. And some of you, it's going to be a little personal. And for some of you, you're going to say to yourself, nobody really knows about it, but you know about it because you feel, you, you feel yourself seething inside. You have felt the rage, the, the slow burn inside of you. And every now and then it comes out, and nobody really knows why. Nobody really knows where it came from, but you do. You remember when you were hurt. You remember when you were betrayed. You remember that disappointment, that broken heart. And it's still there, and it's still bitter, and it still burns. But the good news is Jesus came to set us free, and we're going to learn how to move from that prison of bitterness into some freedom today. So you showed up uh, on a very good weekend. So let's get started. I want to give you some context of what we're going to read. The book was written to a group of Christians who were living in a culture that was really anti-Christian. In other words, it was really tough to live for Jesus in that culture. They were tortured, they were persecuted, they were abused, they were maligned, they were marginalized. I mean, just pick a word, and that happened to Christians. And they were coming to the place where this uh, whole following Jesus thing did not seem to be cracked up uh, the way they thought it was going to be. And they were disappointed. And frankly, they were about ready to throw in the towel. So the writer of the book of Hebrews writes the book to encourage them and remind them of who Jesus is and what Jesus is like and how to live in a hard world. The book of Hebrews never says it's going to be easy, never says it's even going to get better in this life, but it does say we have the power to do this God's way. So that's the context. Tired Christians in an angry world, and here's what the writer records. Make every effort to live at peace 
with everyone and be holy. You're living in a culture like that. Being a Christian, living for Jesus isn't popular. Jesus' style is actually the opposite of what we find in our culture. People aren't living at peace, and they couldn't care one little bit about holiness. But living in peace and living holy lives, I mean, we could just take that phrase right there and probably do a whole teaching series on that. Make an effort to live at peace. Look what it says. With everyone. Let me ask you a question. Have you made an effort to live at peace with anyone, let alone peace with everyone? The writer keeps going. Take a look. Because without this holiness, no one will see the Lord and see to it that no one falls short of grace. We're going to talk about the grace of God. No one falls short of the grace of God. And then look, I wrote instructions for you right there in your notes. Everybody say this with me. And that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and to defile many. I want to talk about a couple of qualities of bitterness. But before we're done, we're going to talk about how to turn that around. Here's the first thing I want you to know about bitterness. Bitterness is a hidden soul killer. It's a hidden soul killer. It's interesting to me that the writer of Hebrews uses the imagery of a root to talk about bitterness, the root of bitterness, a bitter root. Think about it. Roots don't grow on the top of the ground. They grow under the ground, beneath the surface, where nobody can see them. It's really hard to even know how deep they go. You won't know until you try pulling that out or killing it and getting rid of it. I have some experience with this. When my brother and I were young and growing up, we had chores we had to do every week so that we would get our allowance from our parents. And one of our chores was all the yard work. We had to do the mowing and we had to do the trimming. And the thing we hated the most, we had to do the weeding. Because my dad didn't just want us to go and pull the tops of the weeds off in the yard. He wanted us to use this little implement that kind of dug down and loosened the soil so that we could pull the whole root of the weeds. And we'd throw them in a bucket. And dad would come out and he'd look through the bucket. He wanted to make sure that we were actually getting the root. Because it's not the top part that's the problem. It's the root that's the problem. The root is where the life of the weed exists. It's where the strength of the weed exists. It's where weeds get fed and nurtured. And the root of bitterness is where your bitterness gets fed. It's where it stays alive. You're going to have to dig deep to get that out. It's what's beneath the surface. If left unchecked, can have a damaging effect on your soul, on your spiritual life, unpulled and allowed to remain in your life. It's just going to keep showing up and keep showing up and keep showing up. And frankly, it's robbing you of the life that God wants you to live. It's a hidden destroyer. Sometimes these roots of bitterness, you don't even know until you wake up one day and you realize, I've been thinking about this for weeks. This has been on my mind for years. You, you maybe go see a therapist or something and you're asked, how long has this been an issue for you? How long have you been feeling this anger? And you say, for as long as I can remember. Those roots go deep and they can last a long, long time. You know, sometimes we have bitterness and anger over like ridiculous things, you know, small things that rile us up and stay in our mind and we allow ourselves to become bitter over those. But for some of you listening to this, and I know this, You're dealing with paralyzing offenses, the abuse from a trusted family member, the betrayal of a spouse, the deception of a business partner, and you just haven't been able to shake it, and the root is real, and the root is deep, and the root is killing you. Some of you have heard me say this, bitterness is like drinking poison and hoping your enemy will die. It's deep, and it's a killer, and it's in the, in the unseen places of your soul. We've got to deal with it there. Here's the second thing about bitterness. Bitterness spreads to others. You know, the thing about weeds in a yard, weeds don't just stay in your yard. 
those roots, man, it's like a network underground, and they spread, and they spread, and they spread. Sometimes, like, you know, the dandelion and the, and the white things are poof, puff, and those little things are seedlings, and, and it spreads, and it spreads, and it spreads. Look at this. See to it that no one misses the grace of God, that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble, look at this, and defile many. The word there, defile, means to stain. It means to pollute. It means to contaminate. It's the picture of something that spreads. Like if you take a, a, a drop of red dye and you drop it on cotton fabric, it hits in one spot, but then you watch and the dye just spreads through the fabric and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's what happens with our bitterness. Sometimes it happens on purpose. Sometimes we spread our bitterness on purpose. You've heard the phrase, misery loves company. Well, I just want everybody to know how, how hurt I've been. I just want everybody to know how wronged I've been. I just want everybody to know how ticked off I am. And I'll tell you, there's been no better way to spread our bitterness than social media. And you see it there all the time. It's like a cesspool. If you want to get yourself all worked up over something, all you have to do is read certain people's posts because every day they're there with an edge. They're there with their trauma. They're there with their pain. They're there with their anger. And they want you to jump into that pool with them. But listen to me. Listen to me. Hatred and holiness cannot coexist in the same heart at the same time. They can't. And when we invite other people into our bitterness, when we are the ones spewing this venom, what we're doing, not only preventing ourselves from experiencing the holiness God wants us to have, now we're infecting others and we're hurting their ability to be holy. And it happens every single day. You've seen it. One bitter person can cause great harm in a life group. One bitter person can cause great harm in a whole family dynamic. You know, we're not far away from the holidays, and some of you are already dreading that Thanksgiving table, that Christmas gathering, because you know that angry person who's just going to vomit all their wrongs and all the ways they've been hurt and all the past offenses. You know it's going to happen. You dread it. One person can spoil that whole thing. One person can cause division in a church. It kills you on the inside. And then it begins to infect your relationships on the outside. And instead of pulling the weeds, sometimes what we do, we feed the bitterness. I'll give you an example of this. Not long ago, I don't know, maybe two months ago, I realized, man, I'm just reading too much news on my phone. I don't watch television news, but I'll read news articles on my phone, and I've got, you know, some settings where headlines that come in or breaking news that come in or whatever, and so, you know, I'll find myself waiting for an appointment or, or somewhere where I've got a couple minutes, I check the news, and I found myself feeling the angst of the culture, getting sucked into the toxic temperature of the water, starting to feel my mind drift toward unhealthy and unholy kind of thinking. I mean, it was psychologically affecting me, and I've had to dial it way back because that was feeding something that I did not want to exist in me. Listen, bitterness is a hidden killer in your spiritual life, and eventually, eventually, it will poison the relationships around you. You need to make sure that you're not feeding. What you need to do is kill it. You need to kill that root of bitterness. Get it out of your life. So it raises a good question. How do you kill a root of bitterness in your life? Well, I'm glad you asked. The first one is pretty obvious, but it's important. You have to expose it. You have to just name it. You have to just admit it and say, I'm bitter. I'm angry. What we want to do, we still want to blame other people. No, no, no. It's their problem. It's them. It's, it's not me. Well, let's just take a look at what our responsibility is. You know, we couldn't complete this series without reading some sections from our favorite pastor who wrote a lot of our New Testament, Pastor Paul, the Apostle Paul. And look what he wrote to one of his churches. He says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather, what's this, expose them. Bring it to the light. So what is it in you? What, 
What is the anger? Who is it that you have resentment for? Who are you holding a grudge against? You have to confess it. See, that hurt comes in, and, and at first that's all it is. It's just a wound. But then the wound, if left unclean, becomes infected. And that infection then begins to do its destructive work. Some of you know what I'm talking about. When I lost my brother to COVID, I'll have to admit that I had some work to do to make sure that my heart wasn't turning cold and dark. In an effort to protect my heart, I realized my heart was growing cold, and, and I didn't want that to happen. And my attitude was growing dark, and I, I didn't want that to happen. Some of you have felt that at work. If somebody gets the promotion that you know you worked for, that maybe you deserved more. Maybe it's that sibling who's getting all the attention or never does anything wrong, and, and you just hold something against them. You, they got a little more mom or dad's inheritance. I mean, those things divide families, but worse, they infect the heart. Some of you are bitter at the person who's dating your ex, and you don't even want your ex back, but you find yourself resenting that person. The first step to healing is confession. Listen. We begin to heal what we reveal. Say that with me. We begin to heal what we reveal. So we have to be honest. We have to say there is a root of bitterness in me, and we name it. And then we start to pray about it. God, I'm going to need your help with this one. I'm going to need your strength with this one. And here's what God is probably going to start telling you. Listen, be very, very clear. It is you. It's not them. Yeah, a great breakup line. It's, it's not you, it's me. Well, that's actually a great confession when we stand before God. It's not them, it's me. God, I want you to correct me. I know I've been mad at my jerk boss, but I am the one carrying bitterness. I'm the one that needs spiritual freedom. So God, please do your work in me. We expose it, we name it, we acknowledge that there is a hurt. Secondly, and this is where we're going to get a, a little bit deeper into it, we cancel the debt. We cancel the debt. Rather than wanting to get even with that boss, with that family member, with that ex, with whomever, rather than wanting them to suffer, rather than wanting our pound of flesh, rather than wanting some kind of retribution, what if, what if we cancel the debt? What if we forgive? What if we let them off the hook? What if in your heart you just clean it out? Can you imagine? Now I know, I know the idea of this for some of you is so hard. We have this picture in Scripture where the author takes us to the point where he says, listen, I don't want, I don't want any root of bitterness to grow up and cause trouble. But before the writer said that in Scripture, look what he wrote. Make sure no one misses the grace of God. See, it isn't until we acknowledge that we ourselves are people in need of God's grace that we're ever even capable of extending that kind of grace to someone else. In fact, if you were here last weekend, I kind of went through this process. I, I said, what if we begin all of our relationships, all of our interactions with others with the profound reality that I am forgiven, that I didn't deserve it, but God in his grace gave it, and I am so profoundly grateful for grace. Then that makes me more accepting. That makes me more capable of giving overflowing love to someone else. When I know I've received grace, now I have the ability to give the grace. That's why I think the author of Hebrews says, make sure that you don't miss the grace of God. Because without your awareness of your own need and the, the gift you've received of God's grace, you'll never fully be able to cancel someone else's debt and give grace to them. Jesus told a story in Matthew 18 where a servant owed a tremendous amount of debt to a master. And he went before the master, petrified that he was going to be thrown into prison or killed. But the master was gracious. He gave grace and he forgave all of that man's debt. Can you imagine? So this freshly forgiven man walks out of his master's house and he sees a guy on the street who, who owes him just a fraction of what he'd just been forgiven for. And instead of extending grace like he had just received grace, 
he had that guy thrown into a debtor's prison until he could pay it back. And when the master heard what happened, he called the guy back in and look what he said. You wicked servant, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant? Look, just as I had on you. And the Bible says that the master handed him over to the jailers until he repaid all of his debt. And then this is what Jesus said about that story. And this is how your heavenly Father will treat each of you until you forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. We got to choose to give up our right to revenge, give up our right for payback, give up our right to blame. And we do it because of grace, it's all because of grace. That's what we just read in Hebrews. Don't forget the grace of God. Brad, you don't know what they did to me. They, they deserve it. I have a righteous anger. All that might be true, and still the admonition is in place. Don't forget the grace of God. See, we're basing this whole message series on Jesus. Jesus' style. And Jesus went around forgiving People who legitimately had done wrong, had done him harm in some cases. And yet, from the cross, among the very last words Jesus spoke before he died, Father, forgive them. Forgiving the sinner is the essence of the Christian faith. Church, I am begging you to learn the power of forgiveness in your relationships and for your own sake because God in Christ has forgiven you. I know for some of you this is excruciatingly difficult to even consider. But nobody said following Jesus was easy. Nobody said following Jesus was filled with only easy things. There are some hard things to this life, and it's counterintuitive. It's countercultural. It's against human nature. We want revenge. We want to hit back. And yet Jesus called us to live fundamentally differently. So, Brad, how does that work in, in real life? I mean, how do I forgive someone for a real hurt? Man, I've been mad a long time about this. I've been, I've been carrying this around for a long time. How do, how do I deal with it? Well, the first day, you might have to forgive him every minute. Uh, I, I, okay, I'm, I'm going to forgive him. Uh, still mad. All right, Lord, help me let it go. Uh, five minutes later, you know, I'm still mad. And like 10 minutes later, like what, what, a thousand times the first day. Maybe a thousand times the first day of the first week or a thousand times a day for a whole month or something like that. And then what if, what if, like the next day or the next month, it's 750 times or 500 times or it gets less and less. If you really want to be set free, if you really want to experience the cleansing of that bitter root from your life, you expose it and then you forgive the debt. Here's number three. You're going to want to speak a blessing to your offender. What? Brad, you know, you've already stretched me, dude. You've already, like, blown my mind that I've got to forgive them. Now you want me to bless them? You want me to wish well for them? You want me to pray good things for them? Well, what was Jesus' style? Take a look at this. Jesus said, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. And here's the line. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. To bless and to speak well of those who curse you and to pray for those who mistreat you. Dude, that's a whole nother level in your walk with Jesus Christ. The reason we struggle with allowing a root of bitterness to grow in our lives is because we don't think other people deserve the good. We don't think other people deserve the blessing. We, we think that we deserve a blessing because, you know, honestly, Brad, my sin is less than their sin. Remember last weekend I said when surveyed people rated themselves better than smarter than more handsome than you know better workers than the people around them and we also say that we sin less 
than other people around us. And so we deserve a blessing, we think, but we don't think that they do. But the truth of it is all of us have needed the blood of Jesus, and Jesus provides blessing for all of us. And that's why we don't judge, and that's why we give grace, and that's why we bless, because Jesus blesses us. When you realize what God in Christ has given to you, it makes it pretty challenging to withhold that then from someone else. Now, there's another little wrinkle to this I want to address before we finish. You know the person that we hold a grudge against or blame or have a root of bitterness against in our life is very often ourself. I spent a lot of years having a root of bitterness with me. I loathed myself for a number of years. And finally, Jesus freed me from that. And his forgiveness cleansed not only my sin, but helped clean my mind from the shame and that bitterness that existed in me about me, that self-hating place. When I named it and I opened that up, to God's healing power. He did his healing work in my heart. And I've been more able to receive his blessings and recognize his blessings like never before. Does God want you to be free from a root of bitterness? A hundred percent yes. Does God want you to leverage the grace that he's given you so that you can then extend that grace to others? A hundred percent yes. Does it seem unthinkable to you? Does it seem nearly impossible to you? Absolutely. But it is by the power of God in Christ, Jesus in you, what Jesus has done for you that enables and empowers you to extend that to someone else. I want to finish today by reading one final section from our favorite pastor, Pastor Paul. And look what he wrote. Get rid of all bitterness, all rage, all anger, all brawling, all slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Here it is. Just as in Christ, God forgave you. Jesus style. Let's pray together. Father, I know that this is challenging to so many. Like, we just don't want to let it go. We've lived with the bitterness so long, we almost don't know what we do without it. But Father, I pray that your supernatural peace would draw us to a place where we would want freedom from bitterness, deep cleansing from the root of bitterness in our heart, Draw us, God, to a place of honesty. Help us take steps to be free from things that have held us in prison for too long. If you're listening to me right now and you would acknowledge you've spent far too much time living in bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness towards someone else, would you at least be honest in your heart and acknowledge that to the Lord? Say, yes, Lord, that's me. It, I, I confess it. That's been me. Father, I thank you for the courage of your people to confess their sin. And God, help us to operate then in a place of forgiveness. God, knowing what you've given to us, give us the courage to release people from any debt that they may not even know we hold against them. And even now at this moment, for people we've been angry toward, held a grudge toward God, we're going to say for the first time, but we're going to keep praying this, would you bless them? Would you pour your love and grace over their hearts too? We speak a blessing over them, Lord. Set our hearts free. Help us, God, to impact so many others because we are rooted in grace and we're not rooted in bitterness. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen.